So at this time, I'd like to invite Mara Keller to lead the Circle of Remembrance. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Starhawk. And Evely, always wonderful to hear your voice. It was such a deep ritual and healing ritual. Um, I'm sure Carol would love it um, in so many ways. So now it's my honor and pleasure to invite friends and colleagues, close friends and colleagues of Carol to speak stories of remembrance, of their remembrances of Carol. And we've arranged ourselves in alphabetical, sorry, chronological order. Um, some 15 speakers um, speaking for three or four minutes. And after that, we'll have um, some time open to other attendees to speak their memories, but perhaps there won't be enough time to hear everyone. And we will, we have added an afterward, after four, where more informally people can uh, have an opportunity to speak um, and share memories with Carol or so forth. So now I'll begin. Um, I think that uh, V, bless her heart, our logistics fairy, uh, is going to be uh, posting the list of speakers for this uh, time. And the list of speakers uh, will be then bringing themselves in one after another without me introducing them. But uh, we hold this circle, the circle holds Carol. Uh, we hold Carol in our love and memories. And I'm going to begin the circle of remembrances. I've lit the candle and lit the sage. Um, so please bring forward your memories and we'll begin with Gail Kong who has known Carol longer than any of us, I think. Um, she met Carol as a freshman in college at Stanford. So Gail, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Oh, please go ahead and speak. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Um, earlier today, Judith reminded us that Carol said that women's stories have not been told. I will tell part of Carol's story as a very young woman before her scholarly work began. I'm a, a bit out of place here being an atheist and that is not at all to diminish the value of this symposium or of Carol's life. On this day, as we celebrate our intelligence and our learning, there is yet an ordinariness even of consequential lives such as Carol's. The ordinariness might just be grounded in humility as we are all just passing through. Carol and I met as part of the same freshman class, the same freshman dorm, and the same social grouping at Stanford in September 1963. Um, and if you don't know, I'm at the ripe age of 76. I have long believed that anyone's pursuit of knowledge, our ability to learn and create are largely formed by our early lived experiences and here is what I know of Carol's. In family, Carol was the oldest of three children and the only daughter. Growing up in financial comfort, her mother was very supportive. In fact, when her mother died decades before her father, Carol distributed some of her mother's cherished fine china to friends so that we would share her mother's grace. Still, Carol struggled mightily with her father who was overbearingly critical. That particular life struggle, her life experience, which continued even into our senior citizen years through his advanced old age and past wives number two and three, that struggle was the ground on which Carol found her independence of thinking. Stanford in 1963 limited its enrollment of women to one third of the class. And we arrived into that rarefied environment insecure about our public high school education and the absence of storied family histories. Carol was the tallest and the most politically conservative young woman in our midst, and her conservative views did not sit well 
with the other women in the social grouping that Stanford put us into. I didn't like the way people treated her and that was the basis for our, our initial friendship. Even though I'm relatively short, a liberal, and was one of only 17 Asians in our class of 1200. Carol, of course, did very well academically, majoring in religion. Neither of us conformed much, didn't go to football games or join clubs. And in our senior year, 1967, when most things in the world were upside down, we even cut a deal for free housing in a frat house for the summer. She studying and I working. The deal was free lodging for us in exchange for cooking meals for the guys, of course, which neither of us, that cooking, neither of us knew much about at all. <laughs> we, we stayed in touch throughout our years. She first in California, then most of us on the East Coast through her life in Athens, Lesbos and Crete and others will pick up from here. A final remembrance throughout her life, Carol nurtured a warmth of friendship and a love of mother earth and of all her creatures. She loved to set a table with a beautiful meal or walk you around her garden. And she could as easily share her ideas about the state of the world as her recommendations about her favorite soap opera on television. And now in my final chapter, as they say, and in these times of urgent need across the globe, I always hope for more smart, compassionate people to have an oar or two in the water and Carol was always one of those. I will miss her. Thank you. Naomi, are you there? Yes, I have just appeared. Thank you. Um, I'm at a beach right now at Turks and Caicos, and I'm looking out over blue water, the kind of blue that Carol loved. And that's giving me a little bit of comfort. Carol and I were friends for nearly 50 years. A big part of me denies that she is gone. In the decades of friendship, we were never together in the same city for more than a few weeks at a time. We were always writing to one another, calling, taking trains, planes, and buses to meet to go to conferences. At times we were angry at one another for years, but we called and wrote to each other anyway, never talking explicitly about how we disappointed each other, but rather for the most part, we moved ahead, talking about books and people making plans to meet again, both of us hoping that the anger would be upstaged and diminished by other feelings of connection and other adventures. Could this be a model for long-term female friendships? I don't know, you decide. So because of our intense friendship endured over distances and complex feelings and gaps in time, I don't really believe she is gone. No, she isn't gone. A part of me says, we just haven't spoken in a few months, but soon we'll speak again. I haven't wanted this day to come because I think it will make me realize that yes, she is gone. Here are a few scattered memories. I first saw Carol in a lounge at Yale Religious Studies Department. I had just started the program. She was finishing, heading off to New York to teach at Columbia. Carol was holding court, a regal long haired blonde beauty surrounded by a bunch of meek male grad students, several of them Jesuits. She was gorgeous and laughing, leaning back on a sofa, crossing her long mini skirted legs. That happened I didn't speak to her then. I was mightily impressed. I spoke to her a little bit later at an informal grad meeting. I remember a discussion about trickster figures. Someone asked, why do we not have any female trickster figures? Carol said, there can't be any female trickster figures without birth control. I think it was after that insightful and delightful remark that I introduced myself and we started to talk. A talk that only ended a few days before July 14th when she couldn't come to the phone any longer. She and I are physical opposites. She is very tall and blonde. I'm very short and dark haired. Once when we were shopping for clothes in New York, we walked into a small boutique with beautiful things, but a limited selection. Watch what will happen in here, she said. The saleswoman will be nice to you, but not to me. Oh, come on, I said, you're wrong. I went up to the saleswoman and asked if she had something that would fit me. 
She said, oh, I'm sorry. I wish I had something to feed you. You were so petite. No, I wish I could show you something, but I can't. Then Carol asked her, have you got anything to fit me? No, she said, dismissively, shortly, sharply. You are too tall. You should shop in some special stores. So Carol was right. Being a tall woman did not elicit cultural sympathy. Shortness had advantages. In New York, when she taught at Columbia, Carol had a gorgeous faculty apartment and I'd come to visit from New Haven. We went to the theater often. One night we saw The Club, an all woman play in which the women impersonated male characters in the early 1900s at an exclusive men's club. The women didn't change anything about their female appearance. They simply moved around as men, taking up space, spreading out, leaning forward, claiming territory. We loved the play. Afterwards, we walked into the New York summer night, sat down on a bench and began sitting like men, spreading out, taking room, asserting our physicality. Almost immediately, several cars driven by men started honking and hooting. We were being warned, stay in your place. We stopped performing that night. We were a little scared, but I'm glad we fought back as theorists, writers, scholars. In Berkeley, one semester when Carol was on leave and I was writing my thesis, fleeing New Haven, we shared an apartment for a few weeks. We saw an ad in a small alternative newspaper. A class in witchcraft was being offered in San Francisco. We drove there in Carol's purple VW and were among the maybe six other people who attended Starhawk's first class in her apartment in which she presented material from her manuscript, The Spiral Dance. Carol and I were very excited and were able to connect Star with Marie Cantlom, literary rep who helped Star get that groundbreaking book published by Harper and Rowe. As Carol and I absorbed Star's influence and other writers like Merlin Stone and Z. Budapest, and as we read and talked, theology became more and more a focus of Carol's work. She said that after she found the goddess, her class about religion became more hopeful and joyful, whereas before the focus was on the tragedies of patriarchy. We took different paths, but always kept talking, meeting, arguing, and often laughing. A great meeting of minds about the goddess happened about nine years ago when we were at the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin. We got the museum officials to let us spend time in the basement where they kept the Sheila Nagigs, which are images of old women holding their legs open. They're mysterious and they're hidden down there in the basement. We love spending time with those images. We laughed a lot. Carol's influence on me is profound. Knowing that her work is continuing to influence others will I think eventually be a comfort to me for losing her. Thank you. Um, and Ellen Umansky. Is next. You want me next? Okay. I'm, I'm Ellen Umansky, a friend of Carol's and a fellow feminist scholar of religion for over 45 years. I began my graduate work at Columbia University in the fall of 1974. I was a PhD student in the Department of Religion. Among the full time faculty in the department were only two women Jillian Lind, professor of sociology of religion and the newly minted PhD, Assistant Professor Carol Christ. I eagerly enrolled in Carol's course on feminism. I think it was given during the spring semester of 1975. And in her class, I read for the first time works by Rosemary Ruther, Mary Daly, Bell Hook, Jill Johnston, author of Lesbian Nation, and others. It was eye-opening. I saved the many short papers that I wrote for Carol. I think I saved them mostly for Carol's comments, handwritten both in the margins and at the end of each paper. They were different from comments I received from my other graduate school professors, for they not only commented on the quality of my work, but also discussed how much each book seemed to challenge me, if it did. Sometimes Carol astutely noted that the book didn't seem to offer me anything that was new. She also noted the ways in which the particular book about which I was writing seemed to have had or not have had 
an impact on my developing sense of spirituality. I appreciated the thoroughness of her comments and the interest they displayed in my intellectual and personal growth as a Jewish feminist. After the semester was over, Carol and I became friends. She was only a few years older than I was. And since we lived only a few buildings away from one another, often hung out at each other's apartments, went out for dinner, went to the theater, my most vivid memory, 1975, going with her to see for colored girls uh, when suicide is, what is it, when the rain, like now I can't remember the title of the play, uh, for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow isn't enough. And sitting there together when the play ended, not being able to move after the last lines of that play, I found God in myself and I loved her fiercely. Together with Judith Plasco, Carol and I were members of the New York Feminist Scholars in Religion. And after Carol left New York, we made sure to get together at least for a lunch or dinner alone at the American Academy of Religion conference whenever she attended. I remember talking theology with Carol when we were at Columbia, not just feminist theology, but also the theological insights of Elie Wiesel about whom she had written, I think it was an undergraduate thesis. And I also vividly remember going over to her apartment in 1975 and 1976 to help her decorate her Christmas tree. Carol loved Christmas and she had brightly colored Christmas tree decorations. And after we finished trimming the tree, we drink some eggnog laced with scotch. I had had scotch before and liked it, but it was Carol who introduced me to eggnog. <laughs> Carol was an early mentor and later a confidant, someone I could be honest with, knowing that she would be honest with me in return. We had fun together and at times consoled one another. I was saddened when Carol left New York City, but happy for her that she'd secured a tenured position at San Jose State University. Uh, next to speak will be Karen Voss. If you're Karen. Uh, I'm here. Uh, Go ahead. I don't, I don't know how to. Oh, there. There. <laughs> there I am. I've there done it. Yes. But you can hear me. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you, Mara. Okay. In 1979, I was living in Campbell, California, near San Jose. I was pregnant with my third and last child. My then husband, who was teaching philosophy at San Jose State, told me there was a course on goddesses, and he thought it would give me something to do while I was pregnant. Okay, so I thought, why not? Anyway, I signed up and I went. Carol Chris was a teacher. As the weeks went by, I, I was really impressed. And, and then I became enthralled. And I thought, huh, I could do this. I, I meant I could teach. Anyway, I gave my first ever term paper. It was a comparison of Mary and Isis. Sitting at a college desk, my huge, huge tummy could hardly fit in. You know how they are. They have that little thing that sticks out. Anyway, I can still remember how it felt. And that's 41 years and four months later. Um, it kind of reminds me of what Nane had said about giving birth. I can still feel it, literally. Anyhow, I got an A on the paper. And a week later, I had the baby at home. And Carol came around about an hour after the baby. And by then we had gotten really, really close. When she left her rented house to go live in one she'd bought, she arranged for me and my whole family to rent it too. So it was a husband, three girls and cats. And we all moved and we stayed there for 12 years. There are four memories I wanna share and then I'll be done. 
I went on to do a master's degree at San Jose State University. And I became an historian of religions because of Carol Christ and because of Mercia Eliade. She had given me to read Mercia Eliade during that first class. Anyway, I became her teaching assistant. And soon I started teaching myself at San Jose State too. Um, I mean, I was doing a master's degree and it was, it was brilliant. And just like she did, I would occasionally take a mental health day off. That's what she used to call it. And I did it too. And it felt good that I was doing it like she did. One day she and I decided to go antiquing together. Now she had more money to spend than I did. And she bought an antique glass fronted cabinet for $650. And she loved it so much. She took it to Greece. I know that because she told me. Anyway, I got an antique rocking chair for $250 that I still have. Other memory is one beautiful sunny day, we took our goddess group to Alum Rock Park to reenact the Demeter Persephone myth. I was Demeter. I remember that. And then we went to her house and had a bunch of stuff to drink and eat. It was wonderful. I spoke with Carol before she left for Greece. By then, I was going to grad school at the Uni Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, and I went into, I, I went on to live in France for two years, and then Istanbul for 11 years, and then I came to Scotland in 2004, and I'm still in Scotland. I became a British citizen. Anyway, Carol and I stayed fe Facebook friends throughout, and sometimes we PM each other about our love lives. Um, and that was brilliant. This year in February, she video called me. We haven't talked, seen each other for years and years. Okay, she video called me um, from her new apartment in Heraklion. And she was all excited and she showed me around it and all. And at, at least I, I got to tell her I loved her. I got to tell her I loved her. And um, I think maybe she, she called me to say goodbye. I think maybe she had a premonition. Anyway, I'm, I've cried and I'm about to cry again. Two goddesses I have that I keep with me because of you, Carol, the many breasted and the Willendorf mother goddess. Oh, my lovely Carol, blessed be, I will love you forever. And thank you so much to let me be a part of this. I can't tell you what it means to me. Thank you. We're so happy you could join us, Karen, from Scotland. Thanks, Mara. Yeah, bless you. Blessed thank be. Thank you. Thank you. For your love for Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. And now we turn to Charlene, who is next. <laughs> Charlene Spretnak. Um, I first met Carol in a women's spirituality workshop taught by Hallie Eigelhart in her home in Berkeley. And I think that was maybe 1976 or so. And then the next year, uh, in the fall of 1977, by that time Carol had moved to Berkeley, um, I got to know her more because we were both invited to serve on a committee. And that was um, about, <laughs> came about um, from this great idea that a woman in Berkeley had, Carolyn Schaefer. And she determined that the time was right to have a big conference on women's spirituality, the first major one on the West Coast. And um, she got it accepted as an event of the University of California at Santa Cruz Extension Program. So that brought us a big, beautiful auditorium and other facilities. <clears throat> and she invited Carol Christ and myself and a couple other people to be on the planning committee to help her design it, the conference. And um, so that was uh, the beginning of my getting to know Carol and enjoy her that went through all the rest of the decades of her life. We were exchanging emails and again, 
photos of her um, place in Heraklion until just a few months before she died. Um, the conference that we worked on then was turned out to be a grand launch because the speakers included um, Merlin Stone, Z Budapest, Hallie Eichelhart, Starhawk, Kay Turner, and flown out from New York, the artist Mary Beth Edelson, and the scholar of uh, women's art, Gloria Ornstein. And uh, I presented uh, the second day my then new book, Lost Goddesses of Early Greece, which had just been published three days before. And a theater troupe from San Francisco, Mother Tongue Theater, um, performed an interpretation of one of the myths. And all throughout the weekend, there was dancing and drumming and singing. Um, so it was very, very heady, the whole atmosphere. And on the opening night of the conference, which was May March 31st, 1978, um, Carol gave the keynote address. And Carolyn had all of us in the little uh, planning committee on stage sitting behind on either side of the lectern. And after some introductory remarks, Carol was introduced and she walked up to the lectern. I, I seem to think that she had a red dress on that night, a long straight red dress, but I'm not positive about that. However, when she stood at the lectern, um, she was such a majestic figure that uh, it was pretty much the opposite of the almost heady atmosphere in the hall. And suddenly everyone was focused on her, what she was about to say. So she starts with the title, I'm going to talk about why women need the goddess. And pretty soon in her opening comments, she focuses that huge subject down to this, um, what she called this new fierce love of the divine in women themselves. And then she went on to explicate four areas or aspects of women's lives that are affirmed by the spiritual presence of the goddess. So um, she brought such a gravitas to the subject and her thinking was so compelling that everyone in the hall understood that what we were doing, no matter how exhilarating, was a matter of the deepest existential currents. And um, as I was listening to this talk, sitting behind her, I mean, really just about a quarter of the way into this talk, I was suddenly filled with this joyful realization, oh, with someone like this, as one of the leading figures of our little grassroots emergent newborn movement, it's really going to turn out very well. And so it has. Oh, thank you, Shirley. Three minutes, okay. <laughs> yes, so next we're going to hear from Joan Marler. Mm. Hello, Joan. Well, Joan was there. At yeah, her. yeah, okay, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm here now. I'm very happy to hear Charlene tell about this memorable experience because at that time I was living in Sebastopol in our little hand built house where I still am after all these years. And I had just a few months earlier given birth to our daughter. And I somehow saw a flyer. I don't even know, maybe it was in the laundromat or something in Sebastopol. And I had this experience that I had to be there. I absolutely had to be there. I didn't know. I thought I was the only one in the whole universe who was tuned to this. I didn't, I had heard about, I heard, heard about the goddess from Joseph Campbell. When I wrote, when I read that um, he had said that the biblical telling of the, the garden of Eden and the woman and the serpent in the primordial garden was a retelling of a much earlier motif that had been one, you know, 
one uh, sacred expression of the deepest spiritual quest. Well, that just that just enlightened me. And for years, I was working with that through dance, trying to find the sacred ground under my feet, realizing, and so on and so forth, all the damage from patriarchy, etc. And I didn't know anybody who was tuned to this until I saw this flyer. And so I just knew I had to be there. I didn't know how I was going to get there. And I had this little infant baby and I talked to my mother-in-law into coming down with this. We really have to be there. So fortunately she was there wheeling our daughter in and out so that I could nurse her. The moment I saw Carol was, that was something stunning because here, I don't remember what color of dress she was wearing, but she was glowing. She was, she seemed to be 10 feet tall. <laughs> And I was sitting, of course, and she she walked with a sense of purpose, with a sense that what she was telling us was of enormous importance and she knew it. And she turned and she gave the presentation. And for me, it was just the beginning of a whole new life, basically, because she was articulating ideas that I had previously not had the framework to do that kind of articulation to myself before. But, and then of course, in 1982, I got a copy of Charlene's anthology, The Politics of Women's Spirituality. And there was the text, When Goddess, uh, um, Why Women Need the Goddess. And of course, I, I now I look back and I see all the markings that were there. Indeed, it was a momentous event on all levels and life-changing. And I'm sure that everyone uh, experienced that uh, who was there. And one of the things that impresses me of, of many, many things is that the ideas articulated in Carol's talk and in, of course, all the articles that are in this anthology published by, uh, edited by Charlene, are just as current today as they were more than 40 years ago. And I'm looking at the image behind Carol uh, Ellen Bonaparte. Of, it looks like the cresting of the light over the earth. And I was thinking about how that light coming through and penetrating out, we don't all come to it at the same time in our own way, but that illumination that comes in in whatever way it does for us to bring us to something we absolutely have to know in order to take the next step. Some women haven't even found it yet, you see? So everything that's being articulated here, everything that's been published, all of the work of, of Carol, all the work of Charlene, all of the work that all of us are doing matters. And it's not just for us, it's for us, but it's also for beyond us. And that day that I went down, with my talk to my poor mother-in-law into going down, we represented three generations for my little daughter. Hmm. And that to me is something very special, you know, and that of course went on. So I don't want to take up any more time except to say that that illumination that I saw when I first saw Carol walking to the podium and then turning and presenting this life-changing, presentation. When I saw her just before she died, when I had the privilege of recording her for this, um, for this uh, presentation she was giving for the uh, symposium for Maria Gimpetus, uh, I saw her there and once again, she was illuminated, but she seemed translucent. We didn't know that she was dying at that time. She kept saying that she was going to live because she was holding that positive, uh, that sense of holding on to life. But it was stunning to see both images there from one, from so many years ago to then. And uh, I'll never forget it. You know, I feel like she lives in me and, I'm, and uh, she lives in all of us and her work continues and it endures and it is a tremendous gift to all of us. So. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who created this beautiful symposium for her, everyone who's contributed to it. And uh, yeah, I'm in a state of great gratitude. And I want to thank 
I want to thank Alexis, who was with, with Carol when she passed away. I want to thank, thank Ellen, who is doing everything she, she's doing, uh, which continues. I want to thank, I want to thank Laura uh, Shannon, who is her literary executor. You know, the, the three graces here <laughs> who are holding, who are holding this work uh, so masterfully and so beautifully for all of us. Thank you. Joan and Alan Bonaparte will speak next. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, I want to start by saying how struck I am by the fact that there are so many of us, so many women who've known, who knew Carol for so, so many years and continued to know her throughout her life and bonded with her and she bonded with us. And it was such an intense tie. And here we are, all of the women <laughs> that were part of her life celebrating her. And it feels so, so wonderful to me. You probably have heard several times today. Um, I met Carol first in 1977 when the Women's Studies Program at San Jose State I was the coordinator, recruited her, I take a lot of credit for that, as our first tenure track uh, faculty member. Uh, she stayed with me when she arrived uh, and look, was looking for a home to rent. I thought we'd be together about a week. Uh, actually, Carol had pretty high standards <laughs> and we spent a month living together. Um, and we got to know each other fairly well during that time. Af after a month, I said, I'm coming out with you and we're going to find a home today. <laughs> in 1981, uh, I invited Carol to teach in a new summer program that I had started that was called the Aegean Women's Studies Institute in Lesbos. She was actually pretty reluctant about coming since she told me she didn't have very much interest in traditional Greek gods and goddesses. Happily, I prevailed upon her and she came and she created an original course curriculum for the transformative study of women's spirituality in the pre-patriarchal Mediterranean. It wasn't about Zeus at all. <laughs> At that time, she became enchanted with modern Greece, as I did. And in 1988, she, as you heard, left academia, left San Jose State and moved to Greece. She first moved to Athens and then to Lesbos. I was in Athens at the time she moved, working as a diplomat at the US Embassy. And we had many, many wonderful evenings listening to Cretan music and dancing at a nearby Cretan taverna. Um, we had our share of Retsina. You might be able to see that I'm drinking a glass of white wine in Carol's honor. She, um, after uh, her time in um, Athens, um, she moved to Lesbos and she became Carolina. I visited her many, many times in, in Lesbos, in Malibos, and I treasure my memories of spending days at beaches near and far, lunching on fresh fish and swimming in the sea. And Carol's swims were exceptional. She swam a long time, she went far out, and she was usually accompanied by this tiny small poodle named Mitzi, who Carol, trained to be an excellent Olympian swimmer. Uh, when Carol, when Caroline, I should say, launched the Ariadne Institute, I was proud her program, which was created, I think in 1993, was initially inspired by the Aegean Women's Studies Institute and my women's program uh, much earlier. I never got to take a Cretan tour. I know her programs over so many years made an extraordinary impression, as you've all heard, over over 600 participants. Mm -hmm. 
Carol uh, blessed Crete. Crete was blessed by Carol's spirit and brilliance. Um, I've been asked by Mara to also share with you some memories from friends from Molivos. These are friends of Carol's that I knew well, um, and they wanted to be part of this symposium and share some of their memories of her life in Molivos with you. Let me start with a, a piece from Barbara Smith, who's English. Um, she met Carol, or she says Carolina, 30 years ago when she was looking for a house in Molivos and spent many, many happy years with her. This is Barbara's piece. Carol, or Carolina, as she liked to be known here in Crete, Greece, was a great companion and friend for many years. She gave great parties, both at Easter, cooking delicious lamb in her garden oven, often with unpredictable results, and at Thanksgiving, which was always nerve wracking because of the difficulty in locating a turkey on Lesbos. She spent many anxious hours fearing that she might have a Thanksgiving, but without the turkey. Carol became a Greek citizen many years ago, which involved learning the Greek language, not an easy task. Her knowledge about Greece, past and present, along with her communication skills in Greek and English, were invaluable to her many non-Greek speaking friends. She was always generous with her time and loved to share her knowledge. Carolina was extremely knowledgeable about the bird life on Lesbos and would often drive with friends to the salt flats at Kalani, fearlessly taking her little Fiat Panda down winding tracks where no sane person would go to find the best place to watch birds. She spent many years fighting for the preservation of the wetlands on Lesbos, ensuring that they could not be destroyed by development. And she was thrilled when the whole island of Lesbos was designated a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. Carolina instigated the formation of a group called Hame Prasino, Let's Go Green in Molivos to campaign for recycling facilities in the village and on the island. She wrote leaflets, which were distributed in, in Greek, English, and German to every household in the village to explain about recycling. All of this ecological work tied in perfectly with her love and respect for nature and her involvement with the Greek Green Party for which she stood as a candidate in local elections. Another of Carol's enthusiasms was tracing her ancestry. And she was always excited to fill in a new piece of the jigsaw puzzle that was her heritage. Carolina, you are greatly missed. And I have one more piece to read uh, from friends whose uh, names are Robert and Robin Jones but actually in Molivos, they're known as Shanti and Blue. Remembering our friend. Carol was a loyal and generous friend. She was an adventurous explorer, always ready to enjoy a full day, searching out ancient treasures, often hidden on our beautiful island of Lesbos. With books in hand over the last 30 years, we have driven many unmarked, bumpy roads, often walking across thorn-covered fields or searching beneath seawalls to uncover remnants to verify ancient stories. Carolina enjoyed discussing and debating everything. She was passionate about her core beliefs and engaged many with her views regarding the decline of humanity due to the male-dominated religions and governments of the modern world. She was most excited to share her personal beliefs and discoveries, especially from her numerous travels to her beloved island of Crete. It was there that Carolina was truly able to reconnect with the beauty and power of the primal female spirit through dance, art, and ancient ritual. 
She loved her small dogs, Mitzi and Sarah, and they loved her. They were constantly together. They walked old roads, played catch with endless retrieved thrown stones, swam in the sea together. She was knowledgeable and fiercely protective of birds and all wildlife. Her support and tireless work with the Green Party on Lesbos saved our precious wild wetlands. Carol fought an important battle and won. Carolina was a woman whose passion was her love and protection of nature, appreciating its exquisite and perfect rhythms, always honoring and respecting the natural world and its relation to the most positive of the feminine spirit rising. You are missed, dear friend. I think I might just add one <laughs> light note. <laughs> um, because this, reading this brought back a memory of a time that I asked Carolina to take me to the um, site in Lesbos that was a new, that she more or less discovered as an ancient um, temple for Aphrodite. And we went to do a ritual there. And we got to the site, it was in the middle of a farm field, nothing around. Um, we took off our clothes. We covered ourselves in honey and yogurt, and we began our ritual and up pulled a tour bus. And out came a tour guide with a whole group of German tourists who were dying to see the temple of Aphrodite. I don't think they expect to find two goddesses there, but we ran for our clothes and covered ourselves and our clothes in honey and yogurt and took off home. <laughs> Um, Helen, thank you for all those memories of uh, you and Carol in, in Greece um, on Lesbos, and also thank you for bringing those voices of her friends from Lesbos to share with us today. Thank you. Thank you for your friendship with Carol. Uh, now we have two speakers who uh, were there at the beginning of the Ariadne Institute uh, for Goddess Pilgrimages, Goddess Pilgrimage Tours to Crete, uh, beginning with Jana, Jana Rubel. Yeah, I can't get the um, up or I can't video. Oh, there I am, all right. Oh, Ellen, you inspired me to pour myself a glass of wine. <laughs> yeah. I have so many, so many marvelous Carolina. memories with Carolina. Ah, I love you, Carolina. I do. And I love all these memories. And gosh, that was a perfect treat. Thank you, Ellen. So I'm Yana Rubel. And I, along with two friends, went on Carol's, Carolina's first goddess pilgrimage to Crete in 1993. It had been organized by Carolina and a tour agent named Carol Wilkin from Charlottesville, Virginia. The tour was deeply inspiring for all of us. Carolina wanted to continue offering these trips in the spring and fall and she and I had many conversations about working together on this project and all of the logistics around it. While Carolina had already done the hard work of creating the tool, we had to start a business from scratch. We didn't know anything about business. I'm a musician. She's a writer. That meant advertising, creating tour materials, and communicating with potential participants without cell phones, internet, and with skimpy computer knowledge. It became, also became clear that Carolina needed a 501c3 educational designation in order for her to legally be a guide in museums and archeological sites. This was a hurdle which we accomplished and which continues today out of Virginia. We also had to undergo an IRS audit. All of this was stressful and fun and immensely time consuming. 
As interest in the tours increased, Carolina became more confident about Ariadne Institute's importance in her life's work, perhaps a, her crowning achievement. By the late 90s, I decided to return to my work as a musician. However, I did love the excitement and the joy of working together with Carolina to create this beautiful project, which will now continue in the hands of Laura and Mickey. Wish you well. Thank you. Bye. To Carolina. Yamas. Mm -hmm. Yamas. Thank you. Is yeah, um, thank you. Trista there? I'm here, and thank you. I have to say, I feel a little bit out of place. Um, but I'm really honored to be here and uh, with all of you. Um, and I will just share a few thoughts. Um, Carol, to me, seemed like one of those Amazonian goddesses that could never die. So when she did leave us, it was really, really hard. Um, during my, our, I took my daughter, actually, on a pilgrimage with me when she was 12. And she and I were both um, worn out a lot. But Carol was always full on, um, full force, even when if she actually got sick while we were on tour and she just kept going and going. And um, her strength continues to amaze me. It took me a long time, actually, and I have here to <laughs> create a album uh, from our time on. And it wasn't until I did that that I really um, felt the full force of our, our time together on that tour. Um, it was, in retrospect, a really hard tour to take a 12-year-old old daughter who was sometimes cranky and um, not really up to the task, but I'm really glad that we went. And I think that it was uh, probably one of my best will always be one of my best memories of my daughter. And, um, I'm really, really grateful that I had that time. And I'm really, really grateful that Laura can take on the pilgrimage so that more women uh, and their daughters can have this experience because it will go on through the bloodline. Um, it's a fantastic experience. Um, I wrote so many things that I, was going to say, but then I felt like a little bit out of place. But um, I do want to speak a little bit about Carol's work as a personal um, thing for me. Um, before I met Carol in person, I devoured her work for at least a decade, and it had a profound effect on me. Um, it has affected everything that I've done and everything that I've written since then. Um, as someone who grew up in a fundamentalist Christian home, um, Carol opened world to me that I would never have been open to me, actually, um, had I not read her work. Um, it was profoundly healing work. It was profoundly healing to go on pilgrimage with my daughter. Um, there's not any way for me to ad adequately express everything that she did for me on a personal level. And I know that she's done for so many other women. She brought to life something that we had not experienced in words growing up at the church. Um, she taught us an entirely new way of being. Um, many of my fondest memories of Carol are around food. Um, Carol enjoyed eating in a way that I think many women are afraid to express. And I identified with that strongly because I love to eat. Um, so I wanna share one of my favorite passages from Carol about the whole thing, because it's very long, but it's from She Who Changes. Um, and we're going to read it at our ritual tomorrow. Um, we have a big ritual tomorrow, but um, it says, in a still small voice, 
she whispers the desires, desire of her heart. Life is meant to be enjoyed. She sets before us life and death. We can choose life. And I just want to say that uh, one of the things that I really respect and admire about Carol is that she clearly enjoyed life and she lived it. Um, and that's something in, it, in and of itself that I think more women should um, look at because life was not meant to be as hard as patriarchy redesigned. Um, Carol gave us a blueprint of a life that we could enjoy. Um, and for me, um, I'm very emotional. So when I was <laughs> watching the symposium, I was like, oh, everybody is so uh, academic and um, a bit more focused on all of uh, Carol's accomplishments, which were so many. For me, what I, um, I have loved her work, of course, but I love the fact that she lived her life and that she loved her life. Um, so when she died, I cried a lot because I always cry, but um, I had to make a meal for Carol in her honor. And then that's when I felt like, okay, I'm at peace with this. Um, okay, I'm rambling a bit after midnight here and I'm usually in bed about five hours ago. Um, but I did want to say that um, being on pilgrimage with Carol gave me an image of like what life could be like in, in a world where we honored the goddess and we were valued as women. Um, and seeing her read, um, we need a God who leads now was one of the deeply transformative moments of my life because I've had female pastors, and I've had so many um, women in my life that were powerful, but they never really affirmed uh, the divinity in me. Whereas when I heard Carol read that, it was, I can't even begin to describe it, but it was like, I finally saw myself as divine because I'd never heard anyone, um, even a female pastor, affirm my divinity and certainly not my period. And um, being on pilgrimage with her and my daughter was something that will carry on in our bloodline forever. Um, and I'm truly grateful that Laura will carry on with the pilgrimage. And uh, it's, it's so important. It's so transformative. It's so, um, I wish every woman, every woman could go. So, I will leave it at that, but I just want to say thank you to everyone and um, especially Alexis for taking care of Carol and um, Laura for um, carrying on the tradition. Blessings for all of us. Thank you, Trista. And of course you belong here and thank you for your memories and of you and your daughter going on the one of the early Ariadne tours to Crete with Carol and I'm sure you speak for many of the women who went on those tours with Carol and had their own personal experiences and you've expressed that beautifully thank you now we hear from um, colleague Miriam Robbins Dexter, colleague and friend. Hi, Miriam. Hi. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, and all of CIS for making this day possible. I'm so grateful. I first met Mar um, Carol when uh, she came with Mara to an invited symposium in Bergen, Norway, where Trista now lives, uh, and. Um, Carolyn and Joan Marler and I spent a very long evening 
talking and Carol and I were talking about our mothers who we had both lost and we just bonded for a lifetime over our mothers. At that time, Carol was still visiting her father in Orange County before he decided that she shouldn't do that anymore. And she would come visit me in the San Fernando Valley when she, right after she would visit her father. And we had, um, for several years, we were um, had this time together. One time uh, when she was with me, I had to go teach a, a class in goddesses and heroines at Antioch University. And she came with, and she talked to my students for a bit. Um, the next week, I heard from the dean that he was really upset that I hadn't announced she was coming because he had wanted to meet her. I certainly don't blame him. Carol um, was a wonderful friend and colleague. She um, loved to read uh, the academic work of others and, and critique it and have us critique her work. And um, I remember one time she asked me what I had that was new and I sent her something and she sent me wonderful critiques the next day, having read the whole thing three times. She had just amazing, amazing intellectual energy. Um, I read her uh, at the same time, I read her piece on patriarchy, which I think is the best piece on patriarchy I've ever read. And I invited her to submit it to an anthology I was editing with Vicki Noble, uh, Four Mothers of the Women's Spirituality Movement. Well, the next day after she submitted it, I found that no, we were supposed to all write personal things and it, it had to follow a, um, a a sort of narrow form so that we would all be writing similar things. So I had to tell Carol that we couldn't take it and I needed her to submit something else. The next morning, she had a wonderful piece for the anthology. Um, she, well, she was brilliant. Um, in the before that, in the late 90s, I, um, like Trista, I brought my daughter to one of, of Carol's um, Greek, uh, Greek workshops, this, this one in Molibos, and it was life-changing for my daughter, Leah. In uh, 19, a few years ago, Carol asked me to, um, had been asked to um, speak on a, a blog talk radio show uh, about um, Maria Gambudis's Kurgan theory after it was um, proved to be correct. And so we, um, she asked me to join her on, and we got to hang out on this radio show, which was really lovely. So, we talked um, on the phone in emails uh, the next few years. And the last time I talked to her was right after she found out that um, all that was left for her was chemo. And so I have um, been grieving ever since. I miss her very much. And I'm just so, so grateful for what you've done today to help me and others process this grief. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. Bless your friendship. Uh, another friend and colleague, uh, Gina Messina from Feminism and Religion blog will speak next. Thank you, Mara. And I just want to um, express uh, what so many have said so far about how grateful I am uh, to be here today and hearing all of these wonderful stories um, and reconnecting with Carol's work. It's just really been a beautiful and amazing experience. And um, I have to tell you, I was not familiar with Carol's work until I was in my mid thirties uh, in my doctoral program. And I instantly fell in love, um, I fell in love with her work and all that she had to share. And I was so blown away. The weekend before I had my qualifying exams, 
Carol had a retreat in Santa Barbara and I was not going to miss it. So even though I should have been studying, I showed up to her retreat with a stack of books um, that I wanted her to sign. Uh, you know, I felt like I was meeting, you know, the biggest star ever, Carol P. Christ. And um, just two years before that, uh, my mother had passed away. And Carol had written about her own mother's passing. And that was one of the things that I felt so connected with her. Uh, and so uh, a dear friend of mine, Cynthia Garrity Bond, gave me this, this, um, this art, uh, art piece of Demeter and uh, Persephone. And I took this to Carol to show her. And I, I can't imagine how many people must approach her um, in this way. And she was so incredibly gracious and signed all six of my books and uh, took a picture with me <laughs> and talked to me all about my art piece and um, about my grief of losing my mom. I didn't think I'd see Carol again. And a year later, uh, three of my colleagues and I decided to found feminismandreligion.com. And on a whim, uh, we reached out to Carol and said, you know, would you be willing um, maybe to write, you know, a brief article for us, really thinking that she would say no, um, or maybe that she might have something that we could post that's already written. And, um, shockingly, uh, Carol said, let's, let's talk. Of course, the time difference, I was on the phone with her at like one o'clock in the morning, um, which, you know, I would have stayed up till 3am to talk on the phone with Carol. And um, she was so incredibly gracious and excited to participate. And um, we founded Feminism and Religion in 2011. Uh, Carol wrote every week for 10 years. A um, little over 500 articles from her on that on that site. So Miriam, when you said like how brilliant she is, and and asked her for something and she wrote it overnight. I mean, it, you know, uh, it, it amazing. And every week we would all be so excited to see what Carol had to share, and it was really such a testament to who she who she is um, as. Um, a mentor, as someone who wanted to continue the dialogue and make the conversation available to persons who were not inside of a college classroom um, and to be able to have access uh, to the incredible work that she was doing. Um, so I love that not only that Carol Wright every week, but she commented on every single post every day. So, so many of us, uh, you know, are, are, are new, new scholars and new to the field. And Carol Christ commented on my post. And, and what's so wonderful about Carol is that she never sugarcoated. If she thought you wrote something solid, she told you that it was good and why it was good. And if she thought you needed to really brush up on your research, she let you know too. Um, but it was such an opportunity for us to continue to grow. So every, you know, it was this ongoing mentorship over the years with Carol, which was just incredible um, and amazing. And so now as a, as a professor, it's thrilling to me um, to introduce my students to Carol's work. I'm at a small Catholic college in the Midwest. So generally I am their first introduction to Carol. Um, and, and it is just exciting and exhilarating to see their growth and their enthusiasm for what she has shared with us. Uh, and this is the last thing that I'll share with you, but on one morning, I was driving to campus and I had posted on Facebook earlier that my daughter, who was probably seven or eight at the time, uh, told me that I was fat and that I embarrassed her at school, um, which we all have kids who say things like that, right? <laughs> so I had posted about that in a joking way, but also like, oh my God, my 
kid is like not good for my self-esteem. So I was driving to campus and my phone rang and it was Carol. And when I answered it and I'm teaching her book, Rebirth of the Goddess at this moment uh, with the class, right? And I'm driving in and I answered the phone and she sang to me, Gina, you are beautiful. You are so beautiful. It was just one of the most beautiful, beautiful moments. And I almost cried. I was like, Carol, you are so sweet. She said, don't listen. You know how kids are. You're beautiful. You're wonderful. And she she saw that post and just picked up the phone to tell me that. Um, and of course, when I arrived at class, I told everybody, guess who just called and sang to me on the phone? They could have fallen out of their seats. Um, so grateful to Carol and all all that I have learned from her, all that we have all learned from her. And she continues to be in my heart. Thank you so much. Hmm, thank you. No, those were wonderful memories. Thank you. Um, Gina's teaching for us in women's spirituality at CIIS now as well. We're happy she's here uh, teaching a course for uh, next is Phyllis Karat, a wonderful Wiccan priestess and lawyer uh, and author who um, brought Carol to the Parliament of World Religions in Toronto. Phyllis, are you with us? I am. I am. Hi, Mara. Yes, hi. Um, <laughs> I think I also feel like, in a sense, like I don't really fully belong here because these memories are so warm and personal. And I think one of the sadnesses of my life was that I um, kept procrastinating. I think I thought of Carol as an immortal, truly as a goddess. And that therefore I had all the time in the world to finally make my pilgrimage to Crete. And ironically, I was set to go last year with Mara finally in 2020 and then COVID intervened. So I never met her in person. But her spirit was always with me from the very beginning of um, my spiritual journey to the goddess. And that spirit was always this powerful, brilliant, liberating, inspiring energy. In 1980, um, it was her writing, it was Why Women Need the Goddess that offered me an essential connection from my feminist hyper intellectual head where I lived uh, into my very slowly awakening little heart and to the goddess who uh, I totally unexpectedly was led to by the goddess um, embodied in the mother grove of the Minoan sisterhood which was a circle of extremely hidden witches in New York City. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to stay there had it not been uh, for Carol and her writing, because it was in that circle that I found the goddess embodied by uh, the women. And in the years in between 1980 and onward, I read what she wrote. I read it um, with such gratitude uh, and her spirit and her capacities and her brilliance um, helped my own spirit to grow. Um, and I looked forward to the day when I would finally meet her and when I would, people would say, when are you going to Crete? You have to go, you have to go. And I'd say, well, the day will come, you know, it'll be the right time and the day will come and I will go. Uh, but in 2015, I find myself, uh, where no witch had gone before. And that was, uh, as the vice chair of the parliament of the world's religions. And suddenly it dawned on me that I had the opportunity, uh, to bring Carol Christ and the goddess to the main stage at the parliament where neither had ever been before. And uh, so I invited her. And unfortunately she was ill and not able to come. Uh, and she could not address the truly historic inaugural women's assembly and plenary that we had. But uh, Mara was there, Mara spoke to that assembly and Charlene uh, spoke to that assembly. And there were thousands of women there who were cheering and dancing and embodying the goddess full on. And so um, Carol was there. And then in 2018, she was able to speak to the parliament. 
And um, I know it was a great moment for all those who heard her. It was a great moment for the parliament. And I hope, I hope it was a great moment for her. She really, she illuminated and she blessed that convening and she truly embodied the goddess. And um, she is still, and I think um, for as long as I'm here and embodied, she'll continue to be my inspiration. I will have an abundance to read 500 postings on, on that blog. So I will continue to have my soul nourished and enlivened. And, um, and I will make that pilgrimage to Crete. And I know I'm gonna find her embodied there in the company of the women that I go with and in the hills and in the water and um, there. So um, if I may, I would like to offer my thanks, my deep thanks and gratitude, my enormous gratitude um, for her ever present spirit. Uh, it's a prayer. Um, it's Normandy Ellis's translation of the Knot of Isis. It's short, but it seems um, appropriate. So this is my offering and my gratitude to her. At the ends of the universe is a blood red cord that binds life to death, will to destiny and each of us to the other. Let the knot of that red sash, which cradles the hips of the goddess bind in us the ends of life and dream. We are each of us with our own share of hopes and misgivings. Let our thoughts lay together in peace. At our deaths, let the bubbles of blood on our lips taste as sweet as berries. Give us not consolation, give us magic. Give us the spell of living well. We rise and walk, the sky arcs ever around and the world spreads itself beneath our feet. We are bound mind to mind and heart to heart. No shadow exists between our footsteps and the will of the goddess. We walk in harmony, heaven in one hand, earth in the other. We are, we are the knot where the two worlds meet. Red magic courses through our veins like the blood of Isis. Magic of magic, spirit of spirits. We are proof of the power of goddess. We are dust and water walking. And so I ask almighty Isis that you wrap your wings around Carol and that you carry her safely home. Thank you for giving this chance to share and to be with all of you because you are all quite remarkable. Oh. Thank you, Phyllis. You have me in tears as well. That was beautiful. And um, I did want to invite you into this circle of remembrances. I know you hadn't met Carol in person, but you had offered her a platform for the larger world. Uh, it's always so important when we raise one another up so that um, the light can be seen by more and more people. And you've done that for so many women and you did that for Carol. And that was a very a beautiful, moving and um, very deep. Um, offering of love. So thank you. Um, we have um, a statement, Heidi Gartner Abendroth, the founder of matriarchal, modern matriarchal studies in Germany, very much wanted to be here, um, but was unable to join us. She has sent a message to be read by Joan Sishan. Thank you, Mara. So this is from Haida. Many touching words have been said to honor Carol Christ, who has left us. Please allow me to add a few words of my own. I never met Carol in person. I just got to know her when she, I just got to know that she was living in Crete, doing research and women's spiritual pilgrimage there. I was pleased by this information about her. 
For I myself traveled several times to that special island and did research there on Minoan culture, which fascinated me at first sight. In the 1980s, I did a study trip in Crete, guiding women from Germany and explaining the Minoan culture to them. And it was once my dream to live on Crete permanently. When I heard about Carol, I was thrilled that she really did in fact what I only dreamt of. Immediately, I felt a sisterly likeness to her. Suddenly, about two years ago, she contacted me and made herself personally known to me in a very gracious way. She invited me to contribute to feminism and religion, and I gladly accepted. In our email correspondence, she revealed much more sisterly likenesses between us, telling me about her German origin and her German name, Carola Christ. That was striking to me. Then she taught me how to bring my contributions to feminism and religion, for I was not at all accustomed to write on a blog. She was so helpful and supportive and had a lot of patience with my clumsiness in the beginning, just like a sister. So I learned something new from her and her last words to me were that she does not want to lose me on feminism and religion. And I promised it to her. Only after her passing, I learned from Carol's closest friends that my work on modern matriarchal studies was important to her and that she wrote about how Buddhist's work along with my own provided a framework for her interpretation of the egalitarian matriarchal society of Minoan Crete. Yes, that's it. Since a long time, I saw it the same way based on my research there. So I have nothing to add except that I admire her understanding and clarity, and I deeply regret that we cannot share our feelings, findings about the marvelous goddess culture of Crete anymore. She was truly a sister in spirit to me. Now that she has passed and is resting in the arms of the goddess, my gratitude to her will continue. Uh, thank you, Joan, and thank you to Haida for sharing that with us. Uh, we have two more speakers um, from the end of Carol's life and the future of Carol's life amongst us, so uh, in spirit. So now we turn to one of her very best friends, Alexis Masters. Are you still with us, Alexis? Yes. You need to unmute. You need to unmute yourself. Okay. How is that? I I was unmuted. Now I muted myself again. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to make it through this because you've all brought me to the verge of tears so many times today already, but I'm going to start. I first met Carol in 1981 during a Women's Spirit Rising conference held at Marin Headlands across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. I had admired Carol for years then, by then, and appreciated the slideshow presentation she did at the conference. A little later, I was amazed to come across her in tears, all alone in our drafty barracks. I felt worried for her and asked what had happened to make her so sad. She kind of fell into the hug I offered and clung there until her sobs quieted. I don't remember what she told me about why she had cried, but I never forgot how truly tender and vulnerable she was. She never hid that from me, and uh, we went along many years together as friends. At Carol's invitation, I signed up for the 1982 Aegean Women's Studies Institute in the village of Malibos in Lesbos, is where Carol and I began a lifelong friendship that was cemented by the initiatory ritual we did together 
at the Temple of Aphrodite at Tamesa. You can read about our ritual, which has already been spoken about um, in Carol's Laughter of Aphrodite. That institute was transformational for me, a, a frequently espoused sentiment here today. And the ritual set me on a decades long intensive study of the goddess Aphrodite. Throughout the 80s, I traveled back to Greece and the Aegean many times, often spending long, wonderful weeks with my generous hostesses, Carol and Ellen Bonaparte, who was working then um, as a diplomat at the US Embassy in Athens, as she already said. Eventually, the scholarly Aphrodite research I did was morphed into the inspiration for my first novel, published in the year 2000 and republished again in 2016 as The Gardens. Carol and I maintained our friendship into the 90s and the 2000s and were blessed to share many hours together whenever she returned to California. I enjoyed the privilege of reading early versions of her manuscripts over the years and offered what feedback I could. When Carol got her diagnosis of cancer, Carol, Mara, Ellen, and I intensified our calls and began celebrating birthdays and other milestones over Messenger. Such a delight. When Carol's illness took a turn for the worse, I was fortunate to be able to travel on short notice with my little dog Ashton. <laughs> Um, I spent several weeks in Heraklion with Carol, helping with her physical and legal needs and maintaining her magical goddess temple of a household. Tina Nevins was with us part of the time, but once Carol and I were alone, we settled into a peaceful routine. In the afternoons when her energy was pretty much spent for activity, Carol would settle back and I would read her some chapters from a book she found salient to her own work, The Kingdom of Women by Chu Wai Hong. Then in the morning, after running that new material through that magnificent mind of hers, her thoughts would have miraculously aligned overnight. And in true Carol Christ fashion, her words flowed out in fully formed, beautiful prose to become the second half of her final scholarly article about what you have already heard described as the egalitarian matriarchal culture of Crete. Carol's passion and commitment to complete this article were total and she worked as diligently as she could to hand over a comprehensible, mostly complete work to Laura Shannon, whom she had earlier designated as her itinerary a literary executor. She also dictated a brief outline of her planned compendium of blog articles to be published as blogging for the goddess. We turned, I turned both of those over to Laura about a month after I returned from Crete and I was so happy to do so. Carol's dedication to the goddess was absolute and unmitigated. She learned, yearned to live just a little longer but that was not to be. We shared many I love yous all day long, all evening long, but never said goodbye to each other because Carol never acknowledged death, not even with her final breath. She was a fierce, fierce proponent of her goddess. She didn't, she would never concede. This beautiful symposium and all of you presenting and attending have made sure she will indeed live on. Love you, Carol, always will. And thank you so much for everyone. Thanks, Mara. Beautiful Mara. Love you, Alexis. Uh, I too <laughs> want to thank you for all, you know, your loving care for Carol in the last month of her life. And what a blessing you were able to be there with her and surround her with love and um, do everything you could for her and help us to continue to hold her in a circle of love um, <laughs> during that time. Goddess bless. Goddess bless. Thank you. Blessed be. Blessed be. So our final circle for this um, circle of remembrances, a 
community-based biography of Carol Christ is Laura Shannon, who is Carol's literary executive, executive, executor, as Alexis said, and who will also be carrying forward the goddess pilgrimages uh, in Crete uh, moving forward. So Laura, please share some of your th uh, thoughts about Carol for us. And uh, we're moving, we're going over time a bit, and I hope that's all right for everyone. We'll just continue. Um, and Laura, please be our final speaker. Alexis, thank you, everyone. I'm also deeply touched. I just, I want to briefly share that Carol's influence on my life began when I was just 17 and her essay, Why Women Need the Goddess, became a compass for me to steer by through a difficult and dangerous world. But with her help, I followed the trail of the goddess I knew I also needed. And my first glimpse of Carol's face was in the film Signs Out of Time about Maria Gimbutas, which was made by Starhawk and Donna Reed, I think in about 2003, so almost 20 years later. In that film, Carol Christ was one of the speakers and she impressed me very much with her elegance and her eloquence. Then just a couple of years after that, I had moved to Greece in pursuit of the music and dance traditions, which I believe encode remnants of ancient goddess rituals. And one summer evening, I was in Molivos on Lesbos, playing in a Greek band at Maria's Cafe in the courtyard of the old Hammam. I spotted in the audience a tall, beautiful, blonde woman with remarkable elegance and poise who I knew I had never met, but I somehow felt she was familiar. It took a little while for it to dawn on me. That's Carol Christ from Signs Out of Time. What is she doing here? Because um, I had no idea she lived in Greece, uh, let alone Molivos. And so when the band took a break, I went right to her table. I introduced myself. She invited me to sit down. I said I was a fan of her books and we started talking. And I don't know which of us was more astounded at that meeting. Um, me, because I, I was not expecting one of the foremothers of the women's spirituality movement to turn up at our concert in this tiny cafe in Molly Rose, or her, because she wasn't used to being recognized by anyone. And I came to realize pretty much nobody knew who she was, which I could never get over. Um, so she invited me to sit. And um, as I said, we, we got talking right away. And I remember the band had to wait quite a few songs for their drummer to come back to them after the break because I couldn't leave the conversation with Carol and that began our friendship and she was an amazing mentor and guide and sister and um, everything so yeah that was maybe maybe 15 years in 2012 I finally got to go on the pilgrimage with Carol and had a very powerful healing experience at the myrtle tree of Paliani and um, yeah, there's so many stories we could tell about our friendship and the things that connected us, but I'll just say that it was really um, just one of the greatest gifts of my life to have Carol ask me shortly before she passed away if I would take on the directorship of her nonprofit organization, the Ariadne Institute for the Study of Myth and Ritual, and continue leading her goddess pilgrimage on Crete. She also asked me to be her literary executor, to bring some of her unfinished and unpublished articles and books into the world, oh my God. And it's really my honor and pleasure to be given the chance to serve Carol's work and legacy in this way. So thanks to Joan Marler, the first of these, the first part of her article on Gornia in Crete will appear in the Journal of Archaeomythology, I think in the next issue. And thanks to Alexis Masters, who just told us about that, We've got a very nearly complete draft of part two. Thank you, Alexis, as well as the outline of her book, Blogging for the Goddess, compiling her most important and influential blogs from feminismandreligion.com, which Gina was, was talking about. And Anne Key of Goddess Inc. has already reissued Carol's book, A Serpentine Path, about her 
original trip to Crete with um, Mara and Naomi and Ellen were all part of that when the goddess pilgrimage was was created. So um, I also the last thing I want to mention, because for me this is almost the most important part, is that Carol also left me her extensive library of books. And since I live in a tiny house in Greece, which is already completely full of books, we decided that I would turn my garage into the Carol P. Christ Memorial Library and Study Center as a place for visiting goddess scholars to come and make use of the amazing books and resources which Carol had gathered over all these years. Her work on that project is already underway. The house is quite close to Athens Airport, near beautiful beaches for swimming and several excellent tavernas, so we hope that when visiting scholars like all of you eventually come to make use of Carol's library, which I hope will go on for, for decades, if not forever, if I can get my stepdaughter to curate it after I follow Carol to the realm of the ancestors, then you know you, you can also make use of the, the library, but enjoy the sea and the tavernas, the food and wine, and that Greek way of life to really celebrate Carol by being fully embodied in Greece and uh, in her favorite subjects, doing her favorite things really in her honor and in her name. So I really thank everyone for sharing your memories of Carol today. I'm deeply moved and, and just I'm so glad I, I feel I know her better now through all of your stories. And thanks to the team who put together this amazing event and gracefully overcame the odd technical difficulties that came up from time to time. I really hope that I get to meet more of you in person either in Crete in the future as we follow in Carol's footsteps or maybe eventually in the Carol P. Christ Memorial Library. Let's hold that thought and ask the goddess to help us bring it into being. Thank you and uh, blessed be. Thank you, Laura. Um, and thank you for carrying Carol's legacy forward in the world. She does live on and her spirit will be with us. I'm sure on the goddess tours to Crete that you'll be leading next fall and uh, through the library and also through the way you'll be bringing her writings um, further into the world. So um, we're very grateful to you. And, um, and I know your beautiful dancing will be a part of those journeys, so. <laughs> I hope I can come and join you. <laughs> come, everyone. Come, come and dance with us in Carol's honor. I would love to. I hope I can. Well, maybe I can. You know, I want to say my thank you to everyone. This has been a wonderful circle of remembrances, very moving. Um, so many profound experiences shared by everyone.